I'm, I'm actually especially excited this morning because of the movement that Jim and the leaders of this church have us on, on an evangelical mission, a movement to go out and reach the lost. This is very exciting for me because I'm really kind of a go-getter. I don't like to sit around and theorize too much. I like to get up and go and do. And that's exactly what Jim is preparing us to do. Wednesday night classes, the last few weeks, have turned into classes to teach us how to be more effective in our evangelism. Uh, we've received a booklet. Uh, if you have not shown up, and uh, I know you're a little bit behind the curve, but I'm sure that they would still be willing to give you a book on becoming master witnesses. This is what we're called to do, is to go out to be witnesses. Um, in this booklet, there are verses to help you um, sound at least a little bit more intelligent when you're, when you're speaking to others, because I think that is one of our fears, right? One of our fears is, what do I say? So there are some passages in there to help you out with that. So we have classes. Um, we also have verses. that uh, We were challenged with writing down our testimony last week, um, because if you write down your testimony and you become more familiar with your testimony, you'll be better at sharing your testimony. And your testimony is one of the more powerful tools that you have in witnessing to the lost. So we've been, we've been giving all of these things. We've also been given, you know, like you have the opportunity, you can get a little sticker for your car. You put on the back of your car, it shows that you go to uh, First Christian Church of Orange Park. We have uh, invite cards. You know, so if you're not really good at saying something, you can just like here and walk away if you want to. A little awkward, you know. But, and then we have these Easter cards, again, for someone uh, to, to invite someone. And that one specific someone that you've been praying for, I love it. We have the prayer board. A prayer board over there that uh, you get to write down the name of a person or a few people that you are specifically praying for, a lost person that you want to reach for Christ. And I think this is great because the, the church is really trying to equip us to go out and be witnesses for the gospel. But despite all of these tools, classes, booklets, car stickers, invite cards, anything that the church has already given us, there's one thing that the church cannot give you, that the leaders of this church, Jim, nobody can give you to help you be a very effective minister to the gospel. That's one thing that they cannot give you, and that's integrity. And I believe that's one of the most important things that we have to take with us when we go reach the lost. And I believe Jesus kind of hinted to the importance of integrity when he was talking in John chapter 10. I'm gonna, I want you to read, or read along with me, the next slide, if you will. Uh, we're going to kind of set this up this morning. John chapter 10. Uh, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Witness to us, right? Tell us who you are. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And then down in verse 37, he goes on to say, Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Do not believe me unless I do the works of the Father. In other words, he said, check my integrity. Don't believe me just because I say I am one with the Father. Believe me because I'm showing you that I am one with the Father. And, and when I read these words, do not believe me unless, I think, does that mean that our effectiveness of reaching the lost could be hindered by our lack of integrity? I mean, really, what right do we have to tell people to submit to the Lordship of Christ if we are not submitting to the Lordship of Christ? And I read these words and I wonder, can we say them? 
can we say them to the people that we're trying to reach? Do not believe me unless. It's very challenging, but not impossible. And I think that we should make it a top priority if we are making reaching the lost a top priority. No, not even if. Since, since we are making reaching the lost a top priority, I think we should make this statement a top priority. And we're going to look at this today. We're going to actually uh, be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 15 today. So if you want to turn there, uh, first of all, you know, Peter, a, a good person to go to to look at uh, his opinion on this and his instruction on this, because Peter was with Jesus when he was teaching and when he was, I want to say, walking the walk. Because we are being instructed on how to talk the talk on Wednesday nights. You go to Sunday school so you can learn how to talk the talk. But we also need to be able to walk the walk. So Peter was with Jesus, seeing all of these things that Jesus was doing when he was revealing the Father through his works and not just his teachings. So we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 through 15. And I'm going to read this for you. We'll pray and then we'll... Get on with the message. What, what was the first? 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. You. You're welcome. I want you to be with us. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. Let me, okay, I, I got to stop for a second because I want you to know who he's talking to here. Peter is talking to a group of Christians that are just scattered throughout. They live amongst Jews, they live amongst Gentiles, they live amongst pagans, non-believers. They, they just live in the world. So he's talking to Christians that just live in the world, surrounded by believers and non-believers. And this is what he has to say to them. I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as to the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants to God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Let's pray real quick. <clears throat> Father God, we know that we have been tasked, not just through scripture when we are asked to go and make disciples, but also our church leaders are pushing us that way as well. And God, we, we pray this morning that uh, we can learn how to be as effective as possible to reach as many lost as possible given the time that we have here. And God, I pray that this message uh, is preached in that manner, is received in that manner, and that we can go out and be effective witnesses of the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so... Uh, now, this is what I want you to do. Before we begin, I want you to pick someone. Maybe you wrote a name on that wall over there already. I want you to just pick one individual because you're going to kind of role play through this with me. That one person that maybe you're praying for right now. That one person that you've written their name up on the wall or someone that you, don't ha you haven't quite written their name up there, but you know you're actively praying for this person to come to Christ. And that person has become your mission, not just through prayer, but that's the reason why you're studying this book, is so you could reach that person. I want you to picture that person. I want you to have that person or maybe a group of people in mind as we move along in this message. Because I'm going to ask you to write down three things, if you're willing to take the challenge, to be effective in reaching the lost. So the first thing that we read, uh, first, of course, it opens up in verse 11, he talks about um, urging them to live as aliens and strangers uh, in, this, in this sinful world. Do not give in to the desires of your flesh and all of these things. And, and then he goes on, and this is where I'm going to focus on these, these few verses as a group. The first, he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every 
authority instituted among men. So this is what the first question, the first challenge I want you to say today is don't believe me, and you might when this comes up here, don't believe me unless I silence the ignorant by submitting myself for the Lord's sake to every human authority. So as you're witnessing to your friend, I'll say, okay, 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 I've told you enough, but don't believe me unless I silence the ignorant by submitting myself for the Lord's sake to every human authority. And, I, and there's a great example of this. I love this because it really shows Jesus doing this. And Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. It says, Then the Pharisees went out, and this is in uh, verse, starting in verse 15, if you want to just write it down. I don't have it up there. But Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity. I love that. Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? I mean, listen, if, you know, if you're approaching this man of great integrity, is that really your concern? I, I don't think that that was necessarily their concern, but they were trying to trap him. So, but Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites. And I love that. Who can call someone a hypocrite? A person of integrity. <laughs> Jesus, man of integrity, says, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. Hand it over. Where's the coin that you're using to pay the tax? I want to see it. So they brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose image is this? And I, and I was practicing this earlier, and I could just imagine him taking the coin and tapping them on the head with it. Whose image is this? Doink, doink, doink. Who is this? <laughs> and, and whose inscription? Hello? You know, may, I don't know, maybe he wasn't like me, a little sarcastic, but. <laughs> so they're like, Caesar's. Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to him, so give back to Caesar's what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Like, listen, it's Caesar's. Give it to him. Obey. Yeah, just give it to him. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. What did he just do? Silenced the ignorant by just telling them to submit to these authorities. He silenced them. He shut them up. You know, we have a lot of rules that we don't like to obey. And, you know, as a PE coach, obviously not, a, not as good of a PE coach as those that were last night at our Minute to Win It activity. If you missed, you missed out on a great event last night, I'm sorry to say that. But... Um, uh, I, I almost wanted to go into the three things, but I'm not going to. All right, so, so what we have, you know, I'm always trying to explain to children to follow rules. And they want to know why. And sometimes the thing is, is just, just do it. You don't have to like the rule. You just have to follow it. Okay, so uh, here Jesus is pretty much saying that. He's like, you may not like it, just do it. Just do it. So now I want you to picture you with your friend that you just said, okay, don't believe me unless I submit to all of these authorities. And maybe your friend is a coworker. Okay, this is how we can play this out. This is how we're going to make it real. Uh, maybe your friend is a coworker and you have a terrible boss. If your boss is here, please don't move, okay? <laughs> They'll know. All right. But um, it, it, you're, so you're... you're friend that you're witnessing to, um, recognizes that you have this terrible boss, and the boss is always doing mean things, and the friend's like, all right, we need to start a coup or something. We need to, like, bring some laxative to put in their coffee or something. You know, so they're trying to find a way for you to act out against the boss, or maybe even, well, I don't care what the boss says. I'm not going to do that anyway. Has anybody ever heard that? I don't care what the boss tells me to do. I'm not going to do it. But you, as the Christian who's trying to demonstrate just servant to the master, you say, well, listen, let's just do it. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's not maybe the most sound way to do things, but the boss is telling us to do it. Let's do it. And by doing that, you're just demonstrating them this principle. And they're like, well, why don't, why don't you join us in this rebellion? Has anybody here ever thanked God for the job that they have? That their job is a blessing from God? You maybe have prayed for a specific job and God gives you that job. Do you not think God knew who your boss was going to be? 
Okay? It wasn't, I'll give you this job and then replace your boss. <laughs> Some of us may still be waiting for that. God gave you that job as a blessing, and he expects you to submit to the authority. It's simple. This is really simple, but this is a great way for you to be a witness, for you to walk in and be a positive witness to that person that you're trying to reach. Because if you're trying to reach them, but you're going in and you're complaining about everything that your boss is saying, and you're trying to disobey everything your boss is saying, how effective can you actually be? You can't. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. This is, this is really how I get through my day right here. Not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. <laughs> if, that, if anything, you want to tell someone why you're doing what you're doing and why you're banging the boss, say, I'm not working for this person. I'm working for the Lord. It's that simple to be that positive witness. And then you might even silence them. Because here's the best way to silence them is to ask them who pays their check. Who signs their check? Well, the person I can't stand. <laughs> Tap them on the head with the check. <laughs> Whose name's on the check? You're cashing the check, aren't you? <laughs> you don't go to the bank and say, well, I'm, I don't want to cash this check because his name's on it. No, so what sense does it make to have a check with someone's name on it? Just, just do the work, just obey the person. And that makes sense, and you'll silence them. And, and who would have thought, this is what I was thinking, who would have thought not being a disgruntled employee could actually be a good witnessing tool? So that's your first thing I want you to write down, or first challenge I want you to take, is to say, okay, I know I've told you all this stuff, but don't believe me unless I silence the ignorant by submitting myself for the Lord's sake to every human authority. That's almost easy for us to do. All right, just put your head down, go to work. It gets a little bit more difficult. All right, so the next one, in verse 16, he says, Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. So the next thing you need to say is, Okay, okay, yeah, we're going somewhere, but don't believe me unless I deny the flesh and not use my freedom as a cover-up cover for evil. <laughs> Getting a little bit more difficult to do here. And first, I think, as Christians, we love the phrase freedom in Christ, but I think we sometimes abuse the phrase. So how do you actually experience freedom in Christ? Where is the freedom found? Where is the freedom felt? And I thought, first of all, the freedom is felt in no longer being a slave to sin. No longer having to worry about the punishment of death for our sin. I think that's kind of freeing. Think about if, if all you can think about is the punishment. The punishment, the punishment. And then all of a sudden someone comes along and says, the punishment is gone. You are no longer a slave to this sin. You are no longer held captive by this sin. What's the, what, are the, what are the words that we sing? My chains are gone. I've been set free. Is that not just freeing to know that you no longer have to live by the law to, to achieve righteousness, but that righteousness has been achieved for you through the death on the cross? That's freeing. And then to know that death no longer has a sting, that death no longer has to be something that you have to worry about, because some people do worry about death, but if you are a Christian and you are a believer, you don't have to worry about death. You almost welcome death. I'm going to read this for you. Romans 6, 8 through 14. Uh -huh. Maybe. Romans 6, 8 through 14. Now, if we died with Christ, so this is speaking to believers. If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in God and Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that, so that you obey its evil desires. 
Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. That is where your freedom in Christ is found. It's not found in the freedom to do whatever you want, to indulge in every kind of sinful desire. That's where your freedom is found. And then it's how you respond to that freedom. It's how you can be an effective witness. So let's go back to that person that you're trying to reach. And they try to tempt you with these things that maybe you were captive before. I had this girl that I baptized a few years ago. Shortly after she was baptized, she told me that her friends asked her to go out drinking. And she said, no, no, I, you know, I've given my life to Christ. I don't do that anymore. And you know what their response is? is God won't mind if you have just one drink. Now, I'm not here to dispute that. But what I am here to tell you is that that was just their way of trying to be the voice of reason for her. And she still declined. Because knowing that if she would have gone out and then had that one drink that they are so certain that God said is okay to have, then lead to the next one and the next one and the next one. And how could she be a positive witness to her friends while she's sitting there getting sloshed with them? Although I know some drunk people think they're the best theologians around. <laughs> You're not a great witness. <laughs> You may be able to sit there and talk the ears off the bartender, but you're not going to be a great witness, especially if they, if they know the Word of God. How are you going to be an effective witness if you are constantly living in sin? Yet you're telling people not to. This is that part where I said, how dare us tell someone to submit to the Lordship of Christ if we are not submitting to the Lordship of Christ? We are all walking around as saved people, but we're not walking around as servants. And that's what it says. We've got to be servants to God. So think about that person that you're witnessing to, and they know you. They know you, and they know what you've done. Are you living in a way, are you denying the flesh in a way that is being a positive witness? that is demonstrating them the kind of relationship that they need to have. Can you write down right now and say to that person, okay, I've told you a bunch of stuff, but don't believe me unless you see me denying the flesh and not using my freedom as a cover-up for evil. Such a challenging statement. But once again, I think it's extremely important for us and we talk about the, this, this one statement that says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And you're like, ah, see, all I need to know is the truth and the truth will set me free. Let's back up just a little bit. That's John 8, 32. But maybe sometimes you forget to this part. Jesus says in verse uh, 31, if you hold to my teachings, <laughs> you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Hold to his teachings. Go out and don't give in to those sinful desires. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we've got two statements that we've written down so far, hopefully, that you're going to use. Don't believe me unless I silence the ignorant by submitting myself for the Lord's sake to every human authority. That's a really long statement. And then do not believe me unless I deny the flesh and do not use my freedom as a cover-up for evil. The last thing he says, and I, and I want you to remind you, he is kind of talking about submitting to governing authority here and not using your freedom to go against this governing authority. But we can also apply this um, in our opportunity to witness. In verse 17, he says, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So the last statement that I want you to say is, Don't believe me unless I show respect to everyone, even the very least. So this friend that you have... <laughs> This friend that you have, uh, may, maybe, let's, let's do this. Let's, let, let me just say this. Maybe, maybe you um, are the most law-abiding citizen. Maybe you are the biggest yes, ma'am, yes, sir, I'll do whatever you say. Thank you, sir, may I have another person at work. And, and maybe you are very good at not 
giving in to the desires of the flesh. And all of that is well and good, but you can still lose your effectiveness if you are not respectful to everyone. Because you can have some really great people when it comes to obeying the law and to not giving to the desires of the flesh, but then they've got a very bitter tongue, I guess I'll say. They talk bad about people, or they're rude to people. And I don't care if you drive 55 miles an hour and, and are a goody two-shoes, if you are rude to people and you, are, and you have favorites people or people that you don't like, and you're not nice to when you don't respect, you're not going to be effective witnesses. And I'm going to tell you, this is going to be the toughest one for you to recover from. Because <laughs> you've already, this is, this is the one where it's revealed in your conversation with your friends. Because think about that friend that you have. And they've heard you talk bad about people. And uh, you're sitting here trying to witness to them, and all they can think about is that conversation that you had about this group of people, maybe based on their race or sexual orientation or social status, and you've talked bad about them, and they're like, well, you're trying to lead me to Christ, and yet all I remember is how you talk bad about these people. That's going to stick out. That's going to stick out. So this may be a hard one to recover from. You can, but it's important to remember that you have to respect everyone. And I say even the very least of these because in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives this parable where he talks about when the righteous will receive their reward. And he says, and I'm, I'm going to kind of paraphrase it, but he says, um, Come to me, all of you that fed me when I was hungry, gave me something to drink when I was thirsty, clothed me when I was naked, uh, visited me when I was sick or in prison. And they're like, well, when did we do that? And, and, and to paraphrase this, he says, whenever you did this for the very least of these, you did for me. So not just the people that you like, but the least of the people that you see that are in need, you did for and that you did for me. So can you say to your friend, don't believe me, don't believe me. Here's the challenge. Salvation rides on this. Don't believe me unless I respect everyone, even the very least. Can you say that? Now, I'm trying to... The, the purpose behind this sermon was to motivate you to want to go out and be better witnesses to give you one more thing to be aware of as we leave with all of these tools that we've been given. But maybe some of you are like, well, okay, I was gone at number two. <laughs> okay, I just, I can't get past that one. So what I'll do is I'll just hand out the invite card and walk away. And not take my chances <laughs> with my integrity ruining my witness opportunity. All right, maybe someone's there. I've got one more thing I want to use to motivate you to live a life, a, a life that's where people will speak good about you. And uh, as a teacher, we got some teachers in here. Teachers, help me out. I'm, tell me I'm not the only one. When you have a bad child in class, who is the first person you blame? The parent. And you, you, sometimes you excuse the behavior of the child by saying, well, I, I can't blame them. I've got to blame the parents. And then when you meet the parent, you're like, yeah, hey, kid, I'm sorry. It's just what you got. It's the hand you're dealt. But occasionally and rarely, you'll get that bad child, and you've got to think to yourself it's got to be the parenting, but you'll find the parent is doing the best they can, and they're great parents. So you have a great parent who's got a bad child. And of course, our first inclination is to think that just because the child is bad, the parents must be bad. So even without meeting the parents, we see bad child, we think bad parents. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 17. Now this is written to, he's, he's addressing Jews, and as I go along, I'm going to also see how this can relate to you. Because this is not meant to just stay where it was written. This was meant for us as well. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, you don't call yourself a Jew, right? But if you call yourself a Christian, 
If you rely on the law, we rely on the Holy Spirit that lives within us and boast in God. If you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, but we are led by the Spirit, this can still be you. If you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, some of us are convinced that we might be a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, because you have the law, which I want to again say we have the Holy Spirit, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that you should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you not rob ten temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And if there's one phrase that I don't want ever to be said about me, is that God's name is blasphemed in this world because of me. I don't want someone to say, you're a bad child, you must have a bad father. You're behaving this way, God must be this way. You speak bad of people, God must speak bad of these people. I don't want to walk out of here and live in a way where anybody can ever have anything to say bad about God. And if you don't care or are concerned, at least not so concerned as with reaching people, and the effectiveness of your witness, please at least be concerned with this. Please be concerned with the fact that people are looking at us to see how our God is. They're judging our actions to see who our Father is. And that, to me, is a scary thought. See, we tell people to love like Jesus loved but we still have so much hate in us. We tell people to live like Jesus lived, yet we give in to temptation and the desires of the flesh. We claim to be Christians, but we're giving Christ a bad name by the way we live. And we stand no chance of bringing people into a healthy relationship with Christ if that's how we live. We have been challenged with a great challenge from our leaders to go out and reach the lost. And you can use every single one of these things that I've shown you this morning. But if you don't go with integrity, you're not going to be effective. Because I'm going to tell you, before you even have the opportunity to hand your friend a booklet or a sticker or an invite card, they already know you by how you live. Maybe there's a, a person that you're praying for that doesn't know you yet, but guess what? They know you. Have you been nice to that person? Have you been nice to your neighbor? Do they see you not giving in to the desires of the flesh? They're seeing this stuff. And then when you go with the gospel, guess what? The door's already open. The door's already open. You can go in and be effective witnesses to the gospel. I think this fear that I have of not wanting someone to say, or God's name is blasphemed because of you, might have been the fear of Harry Truman when he wrote this prayer. You can put that up there. O oh, almighty and everlasting God, creator of heaven, earth, and the universe, help me to be, to think, to act what is right, because it is right. Make me truthful, honest, and honorable in all things. Make me intellectually honest for the sake of right and honor and without thought of reward to me. Give me the ability to be charitable, forgiving, and patient with my fellow men. Help me to understand their motives and their shortcomings, even as thou understandest mine. Amen, amen, amen. These three phrases need to be motivation for you. And we're going to have an opportunity here in just a minute. The, the, the praise team is going to come up here in a minute, and they are going to pray or uh, sing our song of invitation. And first of all, I want to say that if you are here today and you do not have a relationship with Christ, we want you to have a genuine relationship with Christ, and our teachers here will help lead that, but we also hope that our church members will also demonstrate what a genuine relationship with Christ looks like. But when you come up here to make your decision, 
I want you to, I want you to really, look, if you wrote those questions down or if you have those questions in your mind or those challenges in your mind, I want you to really think about this. And during this time of prayer, if you need to say, if you need to come forward and say, God, <laughs> please empower me to be able to say these phrases to my friends and to the ones that I'm trying to reach, do not believe me unless I act like I know you. Do not believe me unless I am showing them that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. That should be our desire, is to show them that we are one with the Father. So many things that you can use to be effective witnesses. The one thing that's on your shoulders is integrity. Now I've told you, hopefully, some useful things this morning. Read you some scripture. Maybe giving you a couple helpful hints. Don't believe me unless. Let's pray.